guys, welcome back to or welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, my name is Chyan Olchen and we have thank you so much for watching my videos and supporting me. You guys have no idea how much it means to me that people are actually watching my content and it really does mean a lot to me, especially with the series True Crimes of Australia because I have put quite a bit of time and effort and a little bit of money into it like upgrading my equipment to make this series good and yes I didn't upload last week and I'm terribly sorry for that but it was hot as fuck and I got a second set of piercings done as you can probably see I got my seconds done absolutely love them but hurts a tiny bit especially when it's done and yeah, it's really hot. We've been in summer here in Australia for about four or five days, officially, but unofficially for like a month. So yeah, hopefully everyone's doing their back burning, then we don't have a really scary bushfire season. Can only hope that it's not as bad as it was last year, but with climate change and people not caring or doing the right thing, you never know. Anyways, today is episode four on the Ivan Malat backpacker murder cases. And um, this episode I will be covering the finding of Simone Smindle, um, Gabal Nugbauer and Anja Hubschid. I'm hoping I'm saying those right, I hope to god that I am. Correct me if I'm not, I'm not German, I don't know how to say these names. But this is episode 4 and these are the last three known backpacker victims of Ivan Malat to have been found. And yeah, let's get into it. Little disclaimer, like I put it in front of the rest of these videos, um, this video will be talking heavily about rape, murder, gun violence, dysfunctional home and family life, and robberies and mental health conditions. If you feel you are easily affected or scared by things like this, I will recommend clicking off the video now before I seriously dive into this because what happened to these three poor souls is, if you didn't think last week was bad with the other four, this is, reading all of these murders sent chills down my spine, like I could, just the thought of someone being stabbed in the spine hard enough to sever it, it, it was very hard to read all this and it was very hard for me to do, but I did do it, so much pain, so much terror. I can handle pain, horror movies don't scare me, reading this stuff truly did affect me and it made me feel so sad for these victims and for their family and I want to make it clear I'm not trying to use their tragic end to gain any money or anything, I am just talking about the case because I feel that it, the story needs to stay out there, their names, their faces, their stories, they deserve to stay out there and hopefully it can prevent more things like this from happening again. On the morning of the 5th of October 1993, a local potter by the name of Bruce Pryor found a human skull while walking through the Belantolo State Forest and the skull showed no signs of violence but sadly he realised that he had found yet another victim. But Pryor now faced a dilemma. He didn't have a phone and the police station was in battle. So now he faced the decision does, should he leave the skull here and risk someone coming along and moving it or just losing it, like falling away or something, or should he take the skull with him. He chose the ladder and decided to wrap the skull up in a jumper and as he was heading out of the forest he saw a man repairing an old orienteering hut, orienteering very very popular especially in the Belantolo State Forest and he borrowed a phone and called the police in battle who were there in no time and when they got there he showed them the skull and showed them where he found it. The remains were identified as 21-year-old German backpacker Simone Loretta Smindel who had been 
in Sydney previously with a friend and had just left for Melbourne by herself at around 8.15 on the 20th of January 1991. She would meet her mother at the, air the Melbourne airport four days later. She unfortunately did not make it to the Melbourne airport to meet her mum. Her friend Jeanette Muller was actually really smart and tried to warn Simone against going by herself, saying that it probably wasn't safe and to maybe find someone else to go with her. Her reason for not being safe, and she said this to Simone, was because of the recent disappearances, but Simone was insistent. She was like, you know what, I've got this. I've done it before, it's safe, um, nothing's gonna happen, I've got a knife on me, if anything happens, I can protect myself. But sadly, the knife that Simone was carrying for self-protection was no match for Ivan Millard. She was murdered, well, abducted and murdered by Ivan Millard, and at that particular time, Ivan Malat had just celebrated his 47th birthday and he had two days left of his Christmas break from work when he murdered Simone. Her body had been discovered only five kilometres away from where the bodies of Deborah Everett and James Gibson had been found. When the police were investigating the crime scene, they noticed a campfire which was ringed in a nearly perfect circle which indicated to the police officers and investigators that the person who had committed this murder and the other murders before was obviously someone or people who knew what they were really doing in terms of camping and whatnot and that they had experience. Um, this was interesting to police and it really left them with the question of when was this fire built? And I will explain more about that in a minute. When Bruce Pryor found Simone's skull and when the police were looking at it and when they were examining her body, they noticed that there was a compacto mat headband, if you've ever seen one of those, they're really thick, come in multiple colours, very popular back then, still kind of are now. And they found one of these wrapped around her skull, which kind of weird to find it wrapped around her skull but for Simone it was <clears throat> very normal because she was known to wear these types of headbands. She, there's tons of photos of her online of her wearing these and it was not out of place on her but before identifying the body it was kind of out of place to the police officers until they saw photos of Simone. There were still um, some visible articles of clothing on her body and her skeleton still had shoes on much like the other victim and the how they were actually able to identify that the body was Simone Smindle was they had a forensic pathologist and a dental pathologist take a look at the body examine it and they used dental records to because she was really decomposed and DNA testing proved fruitless to them. They used dental records to confirm that it was Simone Smindle, much like with the other victim. Um, I think it's a thing where bodies really decompose, it's really hard to get an accurate toll from DNA. I believe technology's gotten so much better since the 70s and 80s and 90s, well, we're in 2020. And like many other victims of Ivan Malat, she was found with a stab wound so deep that it severed her spine much like the others, apart from Caroline Clark and one more. And police were really questioning whether the fireplace had been built before or after Ivan Malat severed Simone's spine. However, with this case, there are not a lot of sources that can accurately tell you or even do mention the amount of times that Simone was stabbed. And there is no official number like there was for Joanne Walters. However, we do know that she was stabbed at least once and it was enough to sever her spine. 
One source does claim that she was stabbed six more times and it was enough to puncture her heart and lungs. And that after being stabbed seven times, Ivan Malat had then left her on the dirt face down and she had her hands tied behind her back. This same source does go on to claim that Simone's body was covered in twigs, branches, ferns, leaves and that the branches covering her body were in like an X formation and it was kind of a makeshift grave for her. Now when I was talking about there being more to the campfire and why police were um, intrigued by it and were questioning it, there's also a lot of public speculation around it and I too wonder about it and I truly think this is probably what happened. But a lot of the speculation is that they don't know if the campfire was built before or after Simone was murdered and a lot of people believe it was built after she was murdered and that he was, after he severed her spine at least, and he was watching and listening to her suffering. And I, for one, kind of, well, I do wholeheartedly believe this theory that he built it afterwards and was listening to her stuff as she so slowly died. Or, it might not have been slowly, it probably would have been quickly, but he was enjoying those last few moments or seconds of her life. Because when you look at how he's murdering people, he's torturing them, he's possibly sexually assaulting them, and he's severing their spines. It makes me do believe that he was enjoying the pain that he was inflicting, which is honestly heartbroken. Just reading about these murders breaks my heart, and I feel so sad for the victims. I feel so sad that their lives were cut so short by this monster who, honestly, I think they should have brought back the death penalty just for him, which is also what Simone's father felt. And basically he got to live a life on taxpayers' money, in prison, three meals a day. And he got to live until he was pretty old. And it's heartbreaking that he took these lives so young. There is a Wikipedia page about Simone Smindle and her murder. And the page does claim that she was stabbed eight times. Now... Wikipedia is definitely not the most reliable or credible source. Anyone can upload anything to it or change anything, which is good. You can spread a lot of information, but it's also bad because you can intentionally or unintentionally spread a lot of misinformation. However, in my high school and college, they did teach us, you can look at the Wikipedia page, but go straight down to the bottom, look at their link sources and like look at it click on it and read those instead so just a little tip little tip if you're in high school or college and you want to use wikipedia and do it easy go down to the bottom look at the link sources use those another interesting thing to note that i found out when i was back checking my dates is that some of the clothing found at the scene of simone's Murder found at that crime scene were not actually Simone's clothes, but they match another backpacker victim, which were the ones to be found next. And I'll be talking about this a bit more in a second. Clothing found at the scene of Simone's crime scene were not hers, but they actually belonged to another backpacker, Andrea Habshid, and I'll be telling you more about them now. The last known official victims of Ivan Malat were Under Habsheed and Gabal Nugabauer. Who were travelling around Australia backpacking just like the other victims. And Anja was only 20 and Gabal was only... 21 when they were brutally slaughtered and I say brutally because I honestly think what happened to Anja was 
bow bottle and I will explain more in a minute about why I feel that way. They were found on a nearby fire trail to where Simone Mindel had been found and they were found less than a month later on the 4th of November 1993. And when their bodies were found they were in shallow graves 50 metres apart from each other. The couple left Sydney on Boxing Day of 1991 and they were supposed to be heading to Darwin which is 3,148 kilometres away from Sydney and then they were to fly to Munich Airport a month later. But unfortunately they never got on that plane and after a little while the families grew worried and reported them missing. When their bodies were found it was also another confusing case to police because again it's like with Caroline Clark and Joanne Walters it showed that there might have been two killers involved with these murders as well. Sadly Anja Habshid had been decapitated and investigated and police and volunteers were never ever able to find her skull and sadly it is widely believed and police strongly believe this um they believe that she was still most likely conscious when she had been decapitated and it appeared that she was most likely tied in a makeshift bondage device which was found some hundred meters away from where her body was. The bow New Bauer was actually the first of the victim to have been shot. This might sound confusing because of the timeline I'm using which is when each of the victims were found but he was the first one to be shot up until Ivan Malat murdered or slaughtered Caroline Clark. Caroline and Joanne were the first, the last pair to go missing but the first to have their bodies found. So that's why it sounds a bit more confusing. Because Gabal was said to have been really tall, really strong, he really liked to pump weight. This further pushed investigators theory and belief that there was a second person helping him with the helping the killer with the murder because as he was so strong and tall they believed that just one person and especially Ivan Malat wouldn't be able to hold him down control him and stop him from fighting back so they believed that there was a second person to keep him under control while they were decapitating under Habsheet. He was shot in the head six times and had no stab wounds on his body unlike the other victims besides Caroline Clark. And sadly they also believed in this case that sexual assault may have occurred because Gabal's fly was down but button tied up well done up just like James Gibson had been and sadly like James Gibson Gabal knew Gabal's body was far too decomposed for anyone to be able to actually and accurately say whether or not sexual assault had occurred during the murders. Although there were only ever seven bodies found in the Belangelo State Forest and they were confirmed to be the backpackers, police and the public, including myself, strongly disagree that these were the only victims to fall to the malaise. A lot of people speculate that a lot of the missing person cases slash reports that happened just before 1989 and during his reign of terror from 89 to, 90, to, 89 to 93 were actually way more of his victims. Sadly we will never know just how many victims died cruel death at the hand of Ivan Malat until more bodies are found if there are more bodies to be unearthed from the Blantelo State Forest that is. Anyways that is all for today's video. I may sound a bit off. I did have to take a couple minutes to pull myself together a couple times because it 
much as I chose to do true crime, as much as I love it, it is still really heartbreaking to read how these people got murdered and how brutal it was. And I bring it on myself, I know, don't complain, but it's still very heartbreaking. And they're poor souls, may they rest in peace. Um, their story deserve to keep being told, their faces deserve to keep being out there and I will do my part and if telling the, their stories, if telling the brutal facts keeps people safe, if it keeps them from traveling by themselves, I will do it because we need to be more cautious especially these days and there was just that sense of trust back then which some people still had these days, I mean a lot of people certainly don't because that was back when all the serial killers were running amok everywhere. But yeah, anyways, I hope you guys liked this video, if you did hit that like and subscribe button and comment down below if you would like to see more true crime content from me, what cases you would like me to cover and missing persons cases that you would like to see. Keep in mind I am only doing Australian cases as of now because honestly the Australian cases never really get talked about, it's always the American and the um, British cases, never really the Australian. So I'm an Australian, I'm telling the stories that I know and that I have researched. Anyways, I hope you guys liked this one and I'll see you in the next one. Bye! Hold up, before I forget, like I just nearly just did, Sins of the Brother, Les Kennedy and Mark Whittaker on Amazon, and Mullah Inside Australia's Biggest Manhunt by Clive Small, de a detective on the case, and Tom Gilling, Amazon as well, I got these in a bundle, but I have the book linked separately down below. Not an affiliate link, my twisted eyewear one is which is always linked down below but yeah interesting reads you learn more and it definitely keeps you up at night and the writing in both of these books are so different but so great anyways for real this time i love you guys bye